especially for something that's like a new flagship product. Sometimes we'll have add-ons that are a little bit less than that. Hey, welcome back to the Amazing Freedom Amazon Seller Podcast. My name is Nate Slammons, joined by Andy Slammons here. And today we're going to be talking about a topic that we've covered several times, but it's probably one of the most important things to know about selling on Amazon and building your own brand. And it's just the basics of what it takes to look for uh, a product to sell and some of the most common mistakes that we see. So Andy, you've given this talk at a variety of events that you've been at, both speaking, you've done it uh, in our tribe, you've done it in our uh, public Facebook group before, uh, but it always evolves slightly because just the nature of Amazon changing and, and some of the updates. So this is kind of the 2023 version of your brand building on Amazon, how to create your own private label brand. Uh, and and I guess let's take what you've done before. It's kind of like a classic talk and apply it to 2023. So first start off, like, why did you create this or what was kind of the premise around it? And what do you see new as you walk us through these points? Yeah, so we go back to seven or eight years ago, it was relatively easy to bring a product to Amazon because there was a limited amount of offerings and you could basically put whatever you want on there in any category and it would sell. You had very limited competition. And so you were kind of the only game in town. However, as the, as the platform has grown and obviously it now it, it is the largest shopping site in the world by far, it's the you know Walmart of e-commerce, it has gotten more difficult. And so we put this together to really help people understand all that goes into it when you are picking a potential product, when you are launching a potential product and the things that you really need to think about other than you know, like, hey, I have this great idea for this spatula set, but you really don't know all what all goes into it. It takes a lot more than just having the idea of the product. So that that's what we're going to talk about today. So that's probably, you know, for a lot of people, they have some idea of a product, but we know if you just have an idea and you, even if you're super passionate about it and you believe it's the greatest thing ever, if you just throw it up on Amazon, and do nothing else, it's bound to fail. There's very few cases of success where people just throw something up and do uh, nothing else to it. And it, it takes off. The old adage of, if you build it, they will come, typically does not work on Amazon without uh, many other uh, aspects of what you need to do. So you start off here on these slides I'm looking at saying it's all about SEO or uh, conversion rate optimization, probably better known on Amazon. So walk us through that, what you see. Yeah. So if you're in internet marketing, then you understand what SEO is. is. It's search engine optimization. That's when you go to the internet and you go to Google, you're going to type in a search term with whatever you're trying to find. If you you know are looking, maybe you have a health issue, right? You're going to go in, you're going to type in, you know, colon cancer. And that's what's going to come up on that first page is what the internet web is crawling, finding that's relevant to that search term, colon cancer. Answer. Well, Amazon is no different. When you bring a product, you have to understand there are search terms that customers are putting in that search bar. And Amazon, then their algorithm is going to bring back what they think to be the most relevant products to that search term. And so really what we share with people is it's not just the product. You really have to know the keywords that Amazon customers are putting in that search bar to be able to find your product. And so that is kind of the foundation where you have to start. Because if there are not keywords where your product can be found by, then your product is going to sit on page 100. It's never going to be found. There has to be customers that are putting in those search terms? Uh, when we first, uh, years ago, when we were teaching private label uh, and selling on Amazon, there just wasn't nearly as many tools as there are available now. Uh, Helium 10 and you know Jungle Scout are both great. I use Helium 10 more often. And the Chrome extension for Helium 10 is just so powerful now for finding those relevant keywords. I think later in this presentation, you have the massage gun example. So I'm going to start searching on Amazon right now for massage gun. And, you know, the, the Chrome extension actually pulls up the keyword searches. Now, as you search, if you have Helium 10, super helpful because they don't just give you the keyword you're searching for, but all the related 
keywords, kind of the long tail and related keywords. And so Massage Gun has 278,000 monthly searches uh, for it, um, according to Helium 10, which is an insane number of monthly searches compared to a lot of the products that we sell. We don't sell anything that's quite so um, viral or competitive as Massage Gun, but then also shows the next most important. So Massage Gun Deep Tissue has 41,000 and Massage Gun for Athletes has 4,900. And it goes all the way down for, for the top 10 keywords there that are long tail for Massage Gun. And that's just so helpful, Andy. When we had people who used to send us a private label evaluation guide, which meant that they had a, a product idea, but they wanted our feedback on it, we would always ask right on there. I think the number one question we would always ask is, what is the main keyword for your product like you just talked about. But we all know that there's really not just one keyword for any product, even though it's easiest to think of it that way. Typically, there's more than one. And, and for some products, there's really 5 to 10 that all have... Um, usually, there's one main one, but there, there could be uh, 5 to 10 that all have decent, relevant search volume in the multiple thousands. So the tools make it so easy. Check out you know Helium 10 or get your favorite uh, tool to use. And this is much, much easier. But this is still the thing that I look at first when I'm trying to determine, is this going to be a category worth going after? Do deep dive research into each of the uh, main keywords. And if I think they're too competitive or not, which I think segues to the next part of this talk that you would typically give Andy about um, about building your brand on Amazon. And that's the three data points that you would look at when you're trying to choose a potential product. Walk us through those three. Yeah. So, you know, the first one is the keyword search volume, you know, what you just talked about. And, you know, this is one of the reasons why we tell people if, if you're new to e-commerce or selling online, one of the best ways to do it is begin to sell other branded products first to kind of learn the ecosystem because customers are putting in Nike. That's a huge search for a term. And you don't have to really do any type of advertising or, you know, jump through hoops to do SEO because Nike is a name brand that people are putting on Amazon hundreds of thousands of times a day. So that that's, you know, again, one of the reasons why we say start selling name brand stuff, flipping like that, and then move to private label. So the second one is, is the product too saturated? And, you know, we often talk about that finding potential products, it's part science. And this is the data that we were just talking about. And then it's part art. And this is kind of part art. When you look and you search right on Amazon for the main keywords for whatever product you're looking at, when that first page comes up, is it just full of listings that look very similar that maybe have, you know, a ton of reviews? And then can you just keep paging through to page 30, where again, on 30 pages, you got very similar products? That in our mind is probably the product is going to be too saturated and you need to stay away from that. The number one way that we've seen newer sellers get hurt on Amazon is they bring a product to Amazon where there is way too many offerings already of that product and it's too competitive. It costs too much to advertise and that eats into your margin and you just can't get on that first page of search for those terms. And, you know, the, the joke is that you can hide a dead body on the second page of Amazon search, because basically you have to be on that first page if you really want to generate sales. So that's the question you have to ask yourself. You know, am I trying to bring a product to the market where there's already too many offerings? And, you know, it's it's difficult to quantify. And, I, and that's why you call it the art side of it, because it's really hard to say, you know, why when I'm looking at certain searches do I feel like it is too competitive or not, right? There's not, there's really not just one answer. Uh, the number of very similar listings is something you can quantify, like you already talked about. I definitely like to see where when I'm just scrolling down a little bit, there's different looking products or even unrelated products. That's a very good sign to me. Some other things I'm looking for are... Um, the type of competitors and how good they appear like how good are the listing the listing quality in this space are they is everybody seem like they're optimized to the max on that seo side that you already talked about um they have amazing title and bullets and images and keywords those are all things that 
make me think twice about wanting to compete with this aggressive seller or a bunch of aggressive sellers. Uh, and then I'm also always looking at the PPC. Does it seem like there's a amazing headline SBA ad that has a really good image and relevant images and the entire page is full of strong ads? Or there's some searches you go on and the SBA headline ad is just completely irrelevant and, the, and it doesn't seem to be as competitive in the ad space. That's That's hard to judge just by one search. But if you're searching the entire niche with a bunch of different searches, you can start to feel out how aggressive the PPC advertising of that niche appears to be. So those are things I'm usually kind of typically looking at. Anything else that you would say you look for that immediately is a good sign or a bad sign to you? Yeah, we you know we call it the golden gaps when there is a search term that you can see again through using the different tools where people are putting it in Amazon. And, you know, you bring up that first page and Amazon displays listings that are not relevant to that search term. Then that is kind of an indicator that there's probably not enough offerings on Amazon for what customers are searching for in regards to those search terms. So that might mean that you potentially found a really good potential product because, again, it's Amazon's bringing um, other listings that aren't relevant to those terms. What about back in the day? I mean, you hear this is kind of cliche at this point for anyone, but the products that were fit a certain mold, such as a certain size, a certain weight, the country that it comes from, literally, or um, even kind of revenue targets that something falls into. Are you looking at any of that mostly right now when you go in and find kind of a, a new product niche that you're looking into? Can you help explain that again? I'm not like I'm, back, I'm back in the day, question. you know, originally it was always find something small and light can fit in your hand. We came out and we said year, even years ago, kind of before the curve was, hey, we like to do the opposite. We like to look for big things, stuff that um, does require to be shipped by boat versus air from China. Um, we've talked a lot about USA made products in the last year. So things have just changed a lot over the past mm. eight years that we've probably labeled. I guess, what are some of the old cliches that you feel like still apply? And what are some of the 2023... Um, I guess key characteristics that you that that appeal to you when you're looking at a new niche. Yeah, so I, I think one of the things that you and I have learned even over the last two or three years as we've been building our brand, um, you know, that's sold over ten million dollars two years in a row. We're hoping to hit fourteen million this year. Is it really comes down to the margin, and and so you really have to do your due diligence and think about and know and understand and really do the hard work of what that product's landed cost at Amazon is going to be. And then you have to do you know, some real good forecasting on what you think you're going to be able to end up selling that product for. And so Amazon gives you those type of tools right, right in Seller Central, where you can see based on the size and the weight, what, what your margin is going to be, what that pick and pack fee is going to be. But again, that's an area where we see a lot of people, they don't do their due diligence. And so they're bringing a product to the market thinking that their margin is going to be you know, 40%. And then by the time they end up paying all those Amazon fees, all the inbound shipping to Amazon, they're only making a dollar or two you know, per transaction. And, and we know that it just doesn't work that way. So you really have to know your numbers. You really have to do your due diligence and have a really good margin. And, you know, you and I have kind of landed on like, look, we want at least 80% gross margin, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of, uh, that's very difficult to do. I think we've talked about it on the show. If you're going to buy something landed here at your warehouse or, you know, ideally even at Amazon for, let's say $20 that it's selling for a hundred, right? That would be that 80%. And that, that just allows you to do so much advertising and get so aggressive compared to, I mean, we've had products that are definitely more like 40% uh, gross profit in, they can be good, just a lot less to work with. So that's what we're shooting for, especially for something that's like a new flagship product. Sometimes we'll have add-ons that are a little bit less than that. Uh, the other thing is, you know, you mentioned this before, but I think understanding the margin just helps so much if you've already been selling on Amazon or e-commerce in general. It could be D2C, kind of your own Shopify or or eBay, but 
having some experience in our case, it was arbitrage. We talk about a lot, just helps understand the nature of Amazon and the fees and the returns and everything um, that you just miss sometimes if you are selling for the first time. The other thing we always tell people is to allocate a good budget for all the marketing costs you're going to have PPC and your, your images and your just general marketing expenses. So if you're planning saying, Hey, I have $10,000 to invest in this product, plan on really needing 30, uh, 30 to 40% or three to $4,000 of that for marketing. And so only try to spend five or 6,000 on the product in the shipping itself, uh, to, to not, it's almost like when you buy a house and you can't afford your furniture to go in the house and your cat, mm-hmm. your um, um, house rich cash poor, whatever the the saying is. Mm-hmm. You don't want that to be you on Amazon. Um, all right. Well, I think those are kind of like the basics again for what we're looking for in a product. And then as part of the part of this presentation, at Andy, you had just thirteen kind of tips, rapid fire that you always feel like are important for everybody um, to know. So I want you to run through these, and then I'd be interested. Um, for us to kind of real quickly ask ourselves if we think um, these 13 are still relevant or not relevant in 2023 compared to maybe four or five years ago um, when we were starting our current brand more. So run us through those and and then let us know kind of any changes that you would see uh, in 2023. Yeah. All right. So let's just rip through these again. This is private label, you know, primarily again, if you're sourcing from overseas, one of the first things you always have to do with your products is you have to get it inspected. You have to make sure that that manufacturer is making your product to the specs that you received your sample of. So, you know, we often talk about you get a sample and you're going to measure it. If it's a clothing item, you're going to wash it. And then you are going to make sure in writing, get your manufacturer to agree that they are going to produce it exactly to those specs that you say. So another uh, tip that we often give as well is if you've not sourced at all overseas, it is definitely helpful to either use a trading company or use a sourcing agent. So there are out there, if you're on Facebook, you can find some. If you're listening to our podcast and you need a recommendation, I have a few. I don't get any money or any affiliate from them, but they are phenomenal. And it is going to really speed up your process as well as potentially save you a lot of money. Third thing is you have to get a customs bond. If this is a real business, you're not interested in building a hobby, you want to get a yearly bond, costs about $350. That's what you're going to be able to import your goods with a lot less headache by doing that, working with your customs agent. You have to get a freight forwarder. Again, a lot of people get tied up or they get caught up thinking, oh man, how am I, I don't understand shipping. What do I got to do? And that's not how it works. You get a freight forwarder, they connect with your manufacturer and then they handle everything till it shows up at your doorstep, your warehouse or Amazon. Let me, let me ask you this, getting, getting a local one versus Chinese suppliers seem to always have their own. What's your recommendation? Yeah, so we always recommend you want to get a USA one. Um, a lot of times the the suppliers will say, "Hey, you know, they have one," but we've just had too many difficulties. We have used at times uh, Chinese freight forwarders that the manufacturers recommended, and it just seems like when it gets to custom, there have been a number of hiccups. So we prefer you just you know, there's a ton of them here in the U.S. Go with them. The, the, the difference financially is not going to be that good. The fifth thing is you want to get a good manual and inserts to go with your product. If you don't know what those are, I encourage you to go back, listen to some of our pro- podcasts about why we use inserts and then why we create good manuals. Well, I'll talk about good manuals. All of us have received furniture probably. Or we've purchased furniture from the store. You open it up. And unfortunately, what it's what I call Chinglish. It's very hard to understand. And you can see that it was written probably by a Chinese manufacturer. So do the hard work and just make your manual really good. Your customers are going to appreciate it, which is going to lead to really good reviews. You want to benchmark your listing against good listings on Amazon. So again, a lot of people get caught up. They're like, I don't know how to create a listing. It's really not rocket science. You can go on Amazon, look at the listings of products that are similar to yours, and you can get an idea of what you need to do to create a good listing. So just benchmark your listings against Amazon's. When researching a niche, 
one of the things that we often look for to see how competitive it is, is we look to see, are there video ads running? So video is relatively new to Amazon. Probably in the last three or four years, they started sell it, allowing sellers to run video ads. It's still in a lot of different niches. Video ads are not seen. If you are looking again at those keywords and you discover a product around it and you see when you search for those terms that there's not a video ad running, that's really good for you because it probably means that that niche may be a little less competitive as well as now you have an advantage if you create a video ad for those keywords in that niche. We recommend, again, if you're making this a business, it's not just a hobby, you wanna get brand registry. You get a lot of different um, ability to work in Seller Central that you're not gonna get if you don't get brand registry. Amazon has what they call a, a accelerator program. You work with an attorney that they approve and usually you can get it done within five to eight days and then you have access to brand registry. I, so, I have, I have one ahead. thing on that I would say, yep. um, they used the accelerator program when they came out with it was like super helpful because it was the only way to do it fast. But Amazon made it now so you can really work with any attorney to or even do it yourself if you know how to file your own trademark. And then uh, when you go to do brand registry, Amazon just emails that attorney a code essentially proving that they're like the attorney of record for the trademark. And then you can go in and do that yourself now. So it used to be you had to use the accelerator program or wait a super long time, but now you can really use any attorney um, and get brand registered in like a week still. So I think that's something that I've talked to a lot of people and they haven't realized that. So the accelerator program is not bad, but I do think it's a little bit more expensive just because they have like a, a monopoly or, or on on sellers going through the program at this point. So I feel like you're going to pay over $1,000 probably for a trademark through the accelerator for most of them that in my experience. And if you have a local attorney or someone else, you can sometimes get your trademark depending on how many classes you file for, for, you know, 600, 700. So save a couple hundred bucks potentially. So little tip there. Cool. All right. So the number nine is just be prepared. Uh, Nate uh, talked about a little earlier. You're, you're going to have marketing costs. So you're going to have to spend pretty heavy in PPC during the first month of the listing. Uh, Amazon is definitely a pay to play plat platform now. It didn't used to be. Uh, you are going to get your product seen by utilizing Amazon's advertising. So just know that. Make sure you set money aside for it. You need to become really good at PPC. If, if you're not good at it, you need to outsource it to an agency or you need to seek out someone who is good because that's really going to be the engine that launches your product and then keeps your product going. You have to be able to do really good PPC on Amazon. 11th thing is, look, you want to read this book. I'm going to say it uh, slowly. It's titled Poorly Made in China by Paul Midler. It's gonna help you get an inside look into what it is working with Chinese manufacturers. It, it is definitely different. There are huge cultural differences and, and it will kind of be eye-opening on uh, steps that you need to take. And again, how they look at business, how we look at business is very differently. That book again is titled Poorly Made in China, by Paul Mittler. The fifth or uh, 12th thing is we uh, originally a uh, long time ago, we would order a full container of a brand new product. Uh, that's just how we did it. Now we like to start and launch new products with the least amount of possible. So our target number is around 50 units because that's going to give you an idea again of how competitive the market is. It's going to help you kind of understand what the search terms are. It's going to help you understand what the cost is going to be for PPC. And it's just going to de-risk yourself a little bit um, other than doing it the old way when we used to order a full container. So at, if you can at all, negotiate with your manufacturer. Try to always start with the lower MOQ when you're launching new products. And then the last thing is, if you've listened to us at all, you know, one of our favorite podcasts uh, that we listened to early on was Sarah Blakely's interview. It's on the How I Built This podcast. If you have not listened to that, it is extremely inspiring. 
uh, the way that she has been able to build her company Spanx, which now is a multi-billion dollar company. She built it. She was selling fax machines door to door. She then actually um, wrote uh, the uh, patent herself uh, on the designs that she was creating, got her mom, who was an artist, to draw them. So it was really bootstrapping, but extremely inspiring. And what Nate and I often think is, if you want to build something special on Amazon, if you want to build a brand, and we both bootstrapped from you know from the ground up, that's really what you need to do. You need to have that kind of mindset. And uh, so listen to that podcast again, Sarah Blakely. It's, a, it's on the podcast, How I Built This. And I believe it was one of the first ones on NPR. I like ending with that because, you know, there's probably some nuanced changes I would make to each of those first 12 uh, tips there over the years. But at the end of the day, most of it's basically the same. And if you listen to that podcast, that interview with Sarah Blakely, it really all comes down to that. Like you said, do you have the grind and the grit to get it done? And I mean, go listen to our podcast, go on YouTube, do whatever you need to do to learn the process. But at the end of the day, you just have to work hard and, and really grind it out to, to do all the, the little details along <laughs> the way. So hopefully those 13 tips help you um, just get in, either inspired or get you moving on what you need to do next in your brand, uh, whether it's your first product or your 100th. Uh, we've said we're, we're aiming to launch like 60, 40 to 60 new products this year. So we just do the same thing again and again and again, just try to do it faster now. Uh, hopefully this helps you and we'll catch you on the next episode of The Amazing Freedom. Amazon Seller Podcast. See ya.